Welcome back, everybody. We're here to go on and discuss the next section, which is continue with estimating population parameters. Now we'll be talking about estimating the population mean. So our key concept here, the main goal is to represent methods of estimating, of using the sample mean X bar to make inferences and estimates of our population mean mu. So there are three main concepts included here. One, we talked about point estimates. And just like with estimating population par parameters, a point estimate is just taking a sample, finding the mean of that sample, and saying, hey, this is approximately the mean of the population. Confidence intervals, we'll look at creating those intervals, 90%, 95%, whatever level of confidence we want to use, just like we did with proportions. And again, we'll look at calculating the necessary sample size to be reasonably sure that our margin of error is within a, a given limit. So the objective here, let's talk about constructing a confidence interval used to estimate a population mean. Our notation, mu is the mean of the population, x bar is the mean of the sample, S is the standard deviation of the sample. Remember, sigma would be the standard deviation for a population. Now, the reason we don't include the book didn't include sigma here is if we're trying to estimate the population mean, it means we doesn't we are not sure what the population mean is. We probably don't know the population standard deviation either. Little n is the number of items in the sample. Remember along with that big N is the size of the, the number of items in the population. We mentioned in the last section, um, the size of the population really doesn't matter. It's how big of a sample we use that determines how good our confidence interval is. And then E is the margin of error. Remember, that's how far we go on each side of our point estimate to get an interval that we are reasonably sure contains the true population parameter. So requirements. Similar to what we had for a proportion, the sample is a simple random sample. We should add there that it's from the desired population. And either... The population is normally distributed, and that's usually preferable. Or if it's not normally distributed, it doesn't matter. As long as our sample size is at least 30, the sampling distribution will be normally distributed anyway. Our formats, we can either do, we list the, you know, X bar minus the margin of error is the lower limit. X bar plus the margin of error is the upper limit. We can list it using a, an inequality like this. We can list it with in our plus minus form, or we can list it as an interval notation like this, where that margin of error is calculated using the formula similar to what we used for the proportion. We have a critical value. In proportion, it was a critical value of Z because we used the normal distribution. Here, it's going to be a critical value of T. If we had the population standard deviation, we could use Z here. Um, but we're going to use T because we're going to assume we don't have the population standard deviation, times S, which is going to be the sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, N. You might recall this is that standard error of the means from our sampling distribution. So confidence level. The level of confidence is associated with a confidence level such as 95%. Alpha is the complement of that. So if we have a 95% confidence level, alpha is going to be 0.05. Critical level then is based on that confidence level. Remember, we take alpha divided by 2 because alpha is the percent that's outside of the interval, and it's split between the two sides of the curve. So if I have a 95% interval, that means I'm asking for 95% or 0.95 proportion inside the interval, which means 5% or 0.05 is outside, 
since this is symmetrical, that gets split to 0 0.025 on each end. So that 0 0.025, that is the alpha over 2. That is where the T sub alpha over 2 is the critical value comes from. So we can either look up the inverse for 0 0.025, or if we go to this one, adding those up, that would be 0 0.975, would give us that critical value. Now, since I've got Excel up here, let's look at finding critical values. Now, we would need to know the sample size. So let's say that we are using a sample size of n equals 50 here. So our degrees of freedom would be 50 minus 1, or 49 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to do equals t inverse. My probability is 0.975, and my degrees of freedom are 49. I get 2.00958, so 2.010 would be my T critical for that. Now, some, be, some books use T sub C, others use T sub alpha over 2. Either way, it's going to be 2.010 is that critical value for that example. Round off rule. Whatever the original data is, we round the confidence intervals to one more decimal place. So if the data set goes to the nearest whole number, we'll round to the nearest tenth. Summary statistics. When we're using our summary statistics, n, x bar, or s, I round the confidence intervals to the same number of decimal places as we used for those summary statistics. So our T distribution for the population mean is norm is a normal distribution, um, same shape, bell shape, and all that, but it is adjusted for the size of the population. A small sample, or for the size of the sample, I should say, a small sample will have a smaller standard deviation than a large population will. So we the T distribution accounts for that. That's why it has degrees of freedom. We need to know how big the sample is so that we can use the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation. Because the theory, this S here that is the sample standard deviation should be the population standard deviation. It's just most times we don't know the population standard deviation. If we did know the population standard deviation, then we could just go back to the normal distribution or Z distribution and not have to worry about using the T distribution here. So our degrees of freedom, as we said, is one less than the size of our sample. This is, again, what we use, the T distribution uses to help us adjust for the fact that the standard deviation of a small group is going to be smaller than the standard deviation for a large group in general. So key points about the student T distribution, the critical value, the T sub alpha over 2, can be found using Excel, as we just found. Or you can use table A3 if you use the you know, link, the virtual textbook, when you're using my math lab. Excel can be used with any number of degrees of freedom. So that's why I like Excel. Table A3, if you look at that table, you see that there's limited degrees of freedom listed. If you do not have the exact degrees of freedom, use the closest value but use the next lower value. The less degrees of freedom, it gives us a wider range. And we'd rather err. We'd rather have the uh, confidence interval be bigger than necessary than too small. This just illustrates, as I mentioned, the student T distribution is a bell curve. And the bigger the sample size is, the closer it gets to the actual normal distribution. For n equals 3, it's flat. The blue one here is n equals 3. It's flat and wide. As it, n gets larger, the green curve is the standard normal distribution. So usually once n is bigger than 30, uh, the student t distribution is close enough to the normal distribution that many textbooks allow you to just go ahead and use the normal distribution at that point. So the student t distribution has the same bell shape as the normal distribution. It's just wider because, again, samples have smaller standard deviation. So we widen the curve to account for that. 
Student distribution, student t distribution just has just like the standard normal distribution has a mean of zero. The standard deviation of the student t distribution, however, varies with the sample size. Remember, the standard normal distribution has a standard deviation of one all the time. The student t distribution has a standard deviation of larger than one. The smaller the sample is, the larger that standard deviation is. And as the sample size gets larger, the t-distribution really basically becomes the normal distribution. So to construct our confidence interval for the population mean, verify the requirements are satisfied. So it's a simple random sample from the population, and it's either normally distributed or the sample is bigger than 30. If the you know, sigma, remember, is the population standard deviation, if sigma is unknown, we use n minus 1 degrees of freedom and the t distribution to find t sub alpha over 2. If we know sigma, we could just use sigma and then this normal distribution. Our margin of error then, of course, comes from that formula. So using the values that we found for the margin of error, we can find the interval by taking the point estimate, x bar minus the margin of error, and the point estimate, x bar, plus the margin of error to get our range. Of course, we can put that in interval notation as well. And, of course, when we round the results, if we're using original data, we go one decimal point past the original data. If we're using summary statistics, we round to the same place value as the summary statistics. So let's look at an example of finding t critical here, the t sub alpha over 2. For a 95% and a sample size of 6. So 95%. Again, that means 95% is inside the curve. So this is 0.95. I didn't square that up real well. Let's make that a little more even. So that means 0.05 or 5% is outside the curve. That split to 0 0.025 either side. Six degrees of freedom. N equal, or N equals six means we have six minus one or five degrees of freedom. So this cutoff, we'll do the upper cutoff, so it's the 0.025 plus 0.95, that's 0.975 with 5 degrees of freedom. So 0.975 and 5, we get 0 0.2571. So you can see that makes a difference. This was a point, this one up here, was a 95% interval as well, but it was 49 degrees of freedom, a sample size of 50. This was a sample size of 6, only 5 degrees of freedom. Makes a difference in the, the value of t. The curve gets wider because the sample is smaller. So 2.571 is what we're looking for there for that critical value. Because n equals 6, number of degrees of freedom is 5, as we said. We look up the 0.025 or the 0.975, and we get T sub alpha over 2 of 2.571, as we found. So I used Excel. They used the table in the book. The table actually allows you to look up. You can either look the 0 0.025 in the one-tailed, or you could do two-tailed and look up the 0 0.05, depending on how you prefer to use that table in the book. The table in the book is pretty clumsy. We've got Excel that does things exact, so I prefer to use it that way. So the conclusion is T sub 0 0.025, that's my alpha over 2, is 2.571. No matter what method we use to find it, that's the one we want. And like I said, you could use the 0 0.05 because alpha is 0 0.05, and then use the area in two tails column, or you could use the 0.025 and use the area in one tail column. Both will give you the same result um, for that T critical. So let's find a confidence interval. We have these six values here for the weights of randomly selected Reese's peanut butter cup miniatures. They were from the 38 pack, so we're going to assume that this is a randomly selected sample from the population. Uh, it would be better if we took multiple 38 packs, dumped them together, mixed them up, and selected from that. But we'll assume that from one 38 pack to the next, it's pretty uniform. 
First of all, we see here that the label states the total weight is 12 ounces or 340.2 grams. If there's 38 cups, we divide that 340.2 divided by 38 it should give us an average of 8.953 grams. So we're going to use the data here to find a point estimate. And then we're going to go ahead and use that to construct the 95% confidence interval for that mean. <clears throat> and then we're going to conclude, we're going to do an analysis of Based on what we find, do we think it's reasonable to assume that that package is loaded with 340.2 grams as the label says it does? So first, the point estimate is the sample mean. So let's uh, load that data into Excel here. Go to a new page. Okay, there we got it. So it's 8 8.6398, 8.6898, 8.980, 8.936, and 9.042. The mean, now the command that we use here is average equals average. I hate that command because the mean is not, I mean, it's a form of average. But average is just a very sloppy term. So we get 8.8057. Looking here, that's what they say it gave, 8.8057. The requirements, This we're going to assume this is a simple random sample. Um, could be done, like I said, we, taking one 38 pack and drawing out six is a little sloppy. Could have take, bought multiple 38 packs from different locations to see if they're from different batches and mixed them together and selected, but we're going to call this close enough. The sample size is n equals 6, which means it's a small sample. If it was bigger than 30, we wouldn't have to worry about whether the population is normally distributed. However, weights in something like this where we try to get a uniform fill, those do end up being normally distributed, so we're going to assume that this is normally distributive. We have to, otherwise we can't use, we can't make a confidence interval if it's not. We could use the normal quantile plot. If we took the six data points and made the normal quantile plot, this is what we would get. We can see that there doesn't really appear to, it fits the straight line without any other pattern, at least no other clear pattern. You, if you get really picky, you might could find something there, but we're going to call this close enough to be normally distributed. You could use the Excel stat add-in in Excel if you liked. Um, I don't have administrative privileges on this computer, so I can't add in Excel stat, uh, but you could. But I'll show you how to do it without that. It's really not that bad. So we can do the manual calculation. We found the 2.571 is our critical value. I'm just going to go into Excel and use that. Now, we need our standard deviation from our data, which I'll, I'll get as well here. I'm just going to do T critical equals 2.571, just so I have it. This was the mean of the sample. We're going to get our standard deviation. This is a sample standard deviation, so I need the stdev.s. which gives us the point 2054. So my margin of error E equals the 2.571 times my standard deviation of 0.2054 divided by the square root of my sample size, which is six. 
giving me a margin of error of 0.2156, which is what we got here, 0.21589. I had 0.21559. Round that to 0.2156. Oops, they're going to keep it out to 215589. I want to eat those digits. I can just extend that out like that in Excel. I take my point estimate of 8.8057 minus the 2.215589 to get 8.5901. Take my point estimate of 8.8057 plus that margin of error of 0.215589 to get 9.0213. So that is my confidence interval. We are 95% confident that the true population mean is between those two numbers. So that's our interpretation. We're 95% confident that the limits of the of 8.5901 and 9.0213 actually do contain the value of the population mean. So that means if we were to collect many different random samples of six Reese's peanut butter cups and miniatures and find the mean weight of each sample, about 95% of those intervals that we create would actually contain the true population mean. So now the question comes up, is it reasonable to expect the label weight to be accurate? Well, when we divided that out, the 340.2 divided by 38, we got a mean of 8.953. If we go back to our interval, 8.953 is between those numbers. So it is reasonable to expect that the bag could be filled to that amount. If the, the, the value we got from dividing out the bag was outside of this interval, then we would say it's not reasonable to expect. It's reasonable to, we would say that we would expect the, bag, the size of the bag to be outside of that interval and, and not be filled to the correct amount. So again, just the point estimate. If we have the confidence interval, if you use the, like for example, I could use the calculator here. If I get back to my data values here. So on my calculator, I could enter my data. Stat, edit, go into my list. And I could put in, oops, I got to clear out some lists here. So I'm going to clear everything out and we're going to list one. And I'm going to enter 8.639. Eight point six eight nine, eight point five four eight, eight point nine eight zero, eight point nine three six, and nine point zero four two. Now I'm going to exit out of here. I'm going to quit. Second quit. Now I'm going to go to stat, I'm going to go to tests, and I'm going to go to a T interval. My input is data. My data is in list one. So I'm just going to do second one to make that list one. Frequency, we'd always leave it one. We're going to do 0.95 because it's 95%. We hit calculate. And here we get the same interval we had before, hopefully. And we do. What if we were given those numbers? 0 0.5901 and 8.5901 and 9.0213. And we wanted to go backwards and find the point estimate and the margin of error. Well, we'll take those values. 8.8057. And 9.0213. We could add those together and divide by 2. Now remember, when we add them together,
We hit enter before we divide by two. Give us 8.9135. No, that was our, oops, something got off there. What did I get wrong? Oh, I wrote down that number wrong. It's 8.5901, not, that's the mistake. Let me add the correct numbers together there. So we got 8.5901 plus 9.0213. We hit enter and we divide that by two, and that looks better, 8.8057 which was our point estimate for that value. Then to find the margin of error, we would subtract those. We do the 9.0213 minus 8.5901 and divide by two. So 9.0213 minus 8.5901. Again, you hit equals first, then divide by two to get the margin of error. 0.2156, which again, it's rounded, but that's what we were using here, 0.2156. Ah. So if we somehow do know the value of the population standard deviation, the confidence interval then can be used constructed using the standard normal distribution. Rather than using a t-critical, we could use a z-critical. Now, it's uncommon that we would actually know that value, but if that were the case, we could come back here and we could do inverse normal. Actually, norm inverse is what's in here. And it would just be the 0.975. We don't need degrees of freedom. We do have to enter the mean of zero and standard deviation of one to get 1.9599. 1.960 is what we would usually round that to as our Z critical for that case. Then everything else works the same. We would just do that times the standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size, and that would give us our margin of error. Now, this bottom piece here talking about if it's not normally distributed and the sample size is less than 30, this is important when you get into statistical research. It's not part of this class, because it's a little bit more of an advanced method. Um, but it's something to be aware of. If you want to explore it, you can look. It is in section 7, 3, and 7. Actually, that part is in section 7, 4. Um, you will not be tested on it in this class at all. So then that last thing is to go the opposite direction. If we know the standard deviation and we know the confidence level, what size sample do we need from the population to... Or, in order to guarantee that we're within a certain margin of error of the population. So our vocabulary is the same still. Mu is a population mean. Sigma is a standard deviation of the population. X bar is what we would expect or hoping our sample mean. E is the desired margin of error and Z sub alpha over two. Because we don't know our sample size here because that's what we're trying to find, we have to use the Z critical instead of a T critical because remember, that T sub alpha over two requires degrees of freedom. And of course the requirement is we must know that it's going to be a simple random sample. The formula, this just basically is the margin of error formula. You know, e was, if I'm using Z alpha over two, times the standard deviation over the square root of N, and we're just solving it for N when we do that, we get n equals the z sub alpha over 2 times sigma divided by e, and then that whole thing is squared. So if we compute the sample size n, and it is not a whole number, just like with the parameter, we always round up for the required sample size. Because n that we calculate is the smallest possible sample. We can't round it down or it'll be too small. 
We have to round up. We can also use a range rule of thumb. The range rule of thumb is, our, is used to estimate our standard deviation, sigma. And we can just take the range of the data and divide by four because we know that the range of the data, um, two standard deviations to either side of the mean would contain 95% of the data. If we're taking a reasonable size sample, we could assume it's not going to take more than 95% of the data. So we can use that as an estimate if we need to for our, sam for our uh, standard deviation. Now there's a start and improve. We're not going to do that in this class. That's uh, going further than what we want to do in here. But it's one of the methods you could use to estimate the standard deviation. Otherwise, we can just use prior results. Test samples or samples taken by other studies and use the standard deviations found there. And we can use that as a sample standard deviation um, and then go from there. Again, it's going to be a little rough, but it should be close to what we need. So let's assume we want to estimate the mean IQ score for a population of statistics students. How many statistics students must be randomly selected for IQ tests if we want a 95% confidence interval and the SAMP to be within three IQ points of the actual sample of the population mean? So here, we are not given the uh, standard deviation of the population. But we're going to assume it's 15, and I'll show you where that 15 comes from in a little bit. Z sub alpha over 2, 95%. Well, going back to that curve again, 95% in the middle means 5% on each side. So this cutoff here is at 0.975. I'll let you go through the math of finding that again. So the inverse normal for 0.9 or 0.975 gives us that 1.96 is our critical value. So the 15, where the 15 came from, is uh, the normal range for IQ is from 70 to 130. That's a difference of 60 divided by 4. Using that range rule of thumb, the range divided by 4 gives us 15. So that's where that estimate of sigma equals 15, or population standard deviation equals 15, came from. And then we just plug it into the formula. 1.96 times 15 divided by 3 squared gives us the 96.04. I'll show you how to calculate that here in Excel. So this equals, I'm going to do parentheses, 1.96 times 15 divided by the square root of, oops, not the square root of, divided by 3 is our desired margin of error to the power of 2. We get 96.04 exactly like we did in the PowerPoint. And, of course, that rounds up to 97. Always round up, even though that's barely over 96. So among the, th the thousands of statistical students, we need to obtain a simple random sample of 97 of their IQ scores in order to have a confidence interval that we would expect that margin of error to be less than or equal to 3. In other words, we're saying within three IQ points of the true population mean. 